tons to talk about. And when we began uh, broadcasting, in fact, set up the platform seven, eight months ago, one of the issues that we identified and, and we told you about and we've been following is the issue of co-governance and, I guess, uh, by extension, race relations in this country and the feeling, the uncomfortable feeling that we have headed down a policy path which may not end in enlightenment. And I was, well, perhaps not surprised is the wrong word. I was very interested to see an excellent piece published in the Herald by Audrey Young this week in which she went to talk to two, well, former political heavy hitters, um, the former National Party Prime Minister Jim Bolger, and the person who managed treaty settlements largely under Jim Bolger, former Justice Minister and Minister for Treaty Settlements, Doug Graham. And they both uh, spoke to Audrey Young and expressed quite reasonable but quite serious concerns about some trends in the country. And I'm very glad to say, and it's something of a, a trip down memory lane, uh, to be talking to him on some form of radio again. We are joined now... Uh, by, well, we'll call him the Prime Minister, because uh, that's OK. Uh, Jim Bolger is on the line. Uh, Jim, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the platform. Morning, Sean. You're just a tad late on what you said, but never mind. <laughs> Carry on. All right. Jim, um, I am first, I am surprised. I, uh, at one would say that you and Doug Graham were very progressive in your time in power and you moved the ball of, if you like, reconciliation or treaty settlement quite a long way up the field. I would have uh, pegged you, and in recent speeches I've heard of you, as a Liberal, as someone who was supportive of the idea of co-governance, the partnership, we are told now, that the treaty represents. The problem, Sean, is that nobody knows what the government means by co-governance. And this, um, the interview I gave to Audrey Young in the Herald, uh, started on that basis. Uh, and Audrey and I met up at a funeral, actually, on memorial service, and, and she said she'd like to talk to me and about the concept. And I said, I'd like someone to talk to us New Zealanders, like the government, the Prime Minister, talk to us New Zealanders, what they mean by co-governance. I mean, having a multitude of views on that, which you'll find across any group in New Zealand society now, I get asked about it regularly. Um, what is it? How is it going to work? Do I get affected? Don't I get affected? And what's my role? Uh, I just think the government needs to come up and say what it means. What, what's its concept? Explain to us what they hope to achieve in this space. And uh, I think they'll settle down New Zealand quite well. I would observe that what they say they're trying to achieve is that there is a partnership between Māori or Māori uh, iwi and hapu and the Crown and that in most things would seem to me we share governance of the country. That would seem to be what the government is saying indeed and in word. We all share governance of the country in that we're an open democracy. We have a vote every three years or thereabouts and we elect a government and that government goes forth and uh, runs the country. Um, that's the pattern, that's normal, that's accepted, that's the right way to go in a democracy. But what we've now got introduced is another concept. It comes out of a high... Uh, a judgment some years back that talked about partnership but partnership again is one of those words that can mean many things it can be a 50 50 partnership it can be 25 75 percent partnership or any number of combinations you want again it is too elusive to give people comfort that they are confident in what has been proposed for them or what has been imposed on them as the case may be um, and really if um, the Prime Minister wants to uh, give clarity, she should. I mean, why won't she just tell us what she, as the leader of the country, means when she uses the term co-governance? I don't find that complex at all. No, no, it's not. Unless you recognise that what you see as co-governance in the fullness of time would be politically unacceptable to people if you explained it to them in truth now. 
Well, what you're suggesting in that observation, Sean, is that the Prime Minister has been somewhat devious here. She doesn't think... Heaven for the accept- politician should do that, Jim. That's right. I mean, I find it... Up- oh, well, that, that a journalist should suggest it. Uh, that um, if if that's what you believe... Let me, let me reverse the question. Have you ever asked the Prime Minister directly what she means by co-governance as a journalist? Good point. Uh, I don't get the chance to ask him any questions these days. She's not... Um, quite as uh, open and inclusive as you were in terms of media access, I've got to say. Um, Without an explanation from the Prime Minister, people, of course, make their own conclusions or draw their own conclusions. Yes. From your connection with New Zealanders, and you know a lot of them, Jim, what conclusions, in this absence of a clear explanation, are New Zealanders making and is that mood or that perception positive for the country? It's hard to draw together the many strains of thinking in this space across New Zealand. And there are many different thought processes. And yes, I engage and speak to quite a few groups. But, um, but the, I think the fundamental concern is that if everything's going to be mandated, because I get this more than once, that 50% of boards and all areas of activity, uh, all governance periods, are 50% are Maori and 50% non-Maori. Because, of course, non-Maori is far more than European. We now have a big Asian community, a big Pacific community, and so forth. Uh, and that concept, that simplistic concept of just a black and white divide the country in half. My concern is that we divide. I work to try and unite New Zealand, overcome some of those historic errors, major errors, uh, and, uh, and move forward. So I don't want a process where we divide people and, you know, by some... Um, I don't know, lineage back to your ancestors, but how do you defer, define what, who is not? I mean, uh, many, many uh, New Zealanders have uh, links back to many different ancestors, different ethnicities, races, and so forth. That's normal. Um, I just don't think this idea of just 50 uh, 50 actually is a runner. Yeah. Um, if we were looking for an explanation or a statement, actually, just looking at a piece on Kiwi Blog. The Deputy Prime Minister Grant Robertson told the Herald in July that co-governance was, and quote, a manifestation of the delivery of partnership. Well, that's very clear, isn't it? A manifestation of the delivery of partnership. partnership yeah. <laughs> there you go. And, what, and, what, and what's, that, what's that mean in your uh, interpretation of the English language, Sean? That, well, by, by, uh, I marry that with the actions of this government. And that increasingly over time, in all things, we do have a 50-50 split in governance and influence between those who are Māori or or those who are not. And David Seymour, I think, calls that an ethno-state. Well, without uh, joining David Seymour and trying to put a name to these things um, at all, um, he and the Prime Minister, I see, are getting on very, very well together now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, But... uh, (laughs) <laughs> that uh, uh, I'd have to say that the Deputy Prime Minister's definition didn't help at all. And not from my perspective, and I'm sure from the perspective of many of your listeners. Uh, mm. I mean, they either don't know what it is they mean, so they waffle, or they do know, and goes back to a point you made earlier, Sean, they know the public wouldn't like what they mean, and therefore they don't talk about it. But I think we need, going into election year, we need to have some clarity in this. And what I'm asking your fellow journalists and yourself is just ask the Prime Minister, what does it mean to the yeah. honest, ordinary citizen? Yeah. Do you think the current National Party and Mr Luxon, I mean, to be honest, you are more out, you have been more outspoken on this issue than Mr Luxon has since he's taken over the National Party. And every time he's asked about these issues, he fundamentally says, I'm learning to rail. Hmm. 
Well, that's good. I'm pleased he's listening to Rao, and I wish I'd had the opportunity. Uh, but um, as I said in the article in the Herald, I, I think we should uh, have uh, to Rao taught in primary schools, all primary school children, so so that we don't have that divide. What I what my ambition is that we don't divide New Zealand, mm-hmm. and if the language is dividing it because one uh, percent is knows. Uh, a different language, Maori, and uh, and the others don't. Well, then let's teach everybody at primary school. Mm. Something I suggested within weeks of becoming prime minister, but uh, I inherited a rather economic mess, and I had to concentrate on and that. that. And, uh, yeah, it slipped it slipped by, which I greatly regret. New Zealand would be a much richer country if we all spoke to Rio now. Yeah, I mean, you go to countries like Wales or Ireland or Scotland. And they're all speaking their version of Gaelic. How you understand Welsh Gaelic is beyond me, but there you go. Um, and so it's not it's not radical or new or something. It's what happens mm. across the world. And why don't we do that? Do you think this current and ambiguity is heightening or intensifying what racial tension there is in New Zealand? Uh, unfortunately, yes. Because uncertainty will always do that. If people are uncertain, they will either move to one side or the other in their interpretation, or many other sides, I suppose. But, I mean, what they're trying to work out for themselves, and I find this with people talking to me, because they ask me, what does it mean, Jim? And I have to tell them I honestly don't know and have a bit of a chat about it. Uh, I I just think it's uh, very easy for the Prime Minister to clear this matter up and uh, tell us what she means. And if she wants to change what she originally thought, well, that's fine. That happens. But um, just come clean with us. Tell us what it is. Well, we look at the most recent example and probably the most talked about example of the idea of co-governance in action, and that is the Three Waters legislation and a very strange um, (laughs) series of events leading up to the introduction and passing of an entrenchment clause which was then clawed back by the government and the apparent sort of off-the-reservation actions of, of Nanaya Mahuta, the Minister of Māori Affairs. Um, if you were to look at Three Waters being the embodiment of what co-governance means uh, in the absence of a description from the Prime Minister, what do you think of the idea of co-governance as it is manifested in Three Waters? Well, I don't have to tell you or your listeners that Three Waters has uh, had a very, very rocky road in Parliament and in the public and in local government and really across New Zealand. And you would you really just stand back and think, would, is that what you want for New Zealand, that sort of divisive approach? I mean, you've got just about every local government against it. I mean, surely that's not a model that we want going forward for New Zealand Incorporated. So uh, I I just think that the government will want to, in the new year, reconsider co-governance, not co-governance, reconsider the three waters, rather, and and come up with a a different model. I don't see that moving forward right through the the election process as it is. I mean, it's had a very rocky rocky ride. And uh, again, it perhaps manifests the point. Um, if you don't tell people why you're doing things and what you're doing, I mean, I, I watched um, the interview that J- uh, Jack Tane had with um, Willie Jackson on why we're amalgamating Radio New Zealand yeah, and television. Yeah, New Zealand. yeah. Uh, and have you got clarity out of that, uh, Sean? No, and, and the general the expectation the now, Jim, <laughs> is that that's, that's a dead duck, that that will be pulled. Uh, next year, I jokingly said to Chris Hipkins at the Gallery Christmas Party on Wednesday night, so when do you take over as Minister of Broadcasting mm. and clear that mm, mess yeah. up? Because <laughs> um, <laughs> that seems to I be... I surprise well. somebody will. <laughs> yeah. But, um, uh, but so it, what, it, what I'm really saying is you've got this confusion in many areas. Uh, look, the other thing is it seems that this government can U-turn on stuff, immigration settings, probably, uh, as we're predicting, the broadcasting... It's not a government that is af- that is afraid to say it's wrong. We messed up, we'll fix it. But it seems on the issues of co-governance and three water, three waters, there is either an internal conflict or power struggle going on or simply a desire never to mess with these things. Well, yes, they have now altered the immigration settings, thank God. 
I would like someone also to, I'm asking a lot of questions this morning, I'd like someone to explain what the original ones were for. I mean, we're keeping skilled people out of New Zealand. In fact, uh, right here where I live on the Kapiti Coast, a Hungarian family who are wonderful caterers and been here for six or seven years were going to be thrown out. They've now backed down and given them, thank goodness, given them residency. Um, great family. Uh, I, I don't understand the immigration policy at all. Every day the media tells us how many people are missing work, uh, not workers, employers can't get workers and so on and so on. On a regular, regular basis, I'm sure you do on your show. Yeah, yeah, But we absolutely. won't let people in. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't understand that. All right. Well, I Jim, I think it. you've asked some good questions. You, you should have been a journalist. You've asked some great questions That's today. That's what I should have been. That's <laughs> I should have been a journalist, not a politician. <laughs> I had more fun, yes. <laughs> and, to okay, be on, and to be honest, the problem is these are questions that, met, well, a lot in the media, some in the media don't bother asking anymore. It's just a government that's very hard to get straight answers out of, Jim. Try harder, Sean. That's the only advice I can give you. And have a great Christmas. You too to you Enjoy and Joan. It. Have a great time. Thank you. Thank you. That is Jim Bolt, your former Prime Minister, National Party Prime Minister, and I think actually in a very reasonable and low-key way, he's asked the question that we really don't get a straight answer to. What's the end point? What is the end point of the treaty partnership? And Doug Graham in, the, in, in his discussion with the Herald also pointed out everyone talks about a particular court case delivered by Lord Cook of Thorndon uh, in the 80s, I think it was, that defined the treaty as a partnership. Well, the interesting thing is a close reading of that judgment is that it didn't. It said it's like a partnership, like a partnership, but not a partnership. And a partnership can be unequal. You can have an 80-20 partnership, right? You can have a marriage that's a partnership and one person is a complete a-hole and the other one just takes what comes their way. Not speaking from personal experience. So what I'm saying, I think Jim Bolger asks a very fundamental question uh, and I'm sure the problem is, and I can tell you, I, I, you know, the Prime Minister could, you know, make me die of amazement and ring up and say, oh, I want an interview, I want to answer that question. But I imagine the answer would be that she rejects the premise of the question and really she'll get back to you. There'll be an announcement about that. But we do need to know the answer. 